Medicare for all, secure family supporting wages, free college, economic security even for those who are unwilling to work, all while retooling the economy to save the planet from global warming. These are the promises of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, and others on the left who rally under the banner of socialism. However, AOC's rise to fame and the promotion of the ideals of socialism seem to be as much of an annoyance as it is a boon to the Democratic Party establishment, with members of the aging Democratic leadership refusing to openly support many of her policy proposals. These ideas aren't new, however, and Democrats have been in complete power in the U.S. government before. Since this has been the case, why hasn't more been done on these issues before now? It is easy to point to and complain about Republican interference, but as previously stated, uh, Democrats have had vote-controlling majorities in both houses and the presidency without seeing any of the sweeping changes that socialism would seem to promise. Since this has been the case, there must be something else holding the Democratic leadership back from fully supporting these socialist programs, and if so, what is it? First, let's make a pragmatic case for at least some form of increased economic redistribution from the point of view of politicians. This means something that gets politicians re-elected. A good argument, in my opinion, for greater economic redistribution from the point of view of a left-leaning politician would be something along these lines. Democrats, in an honest post-election analysis, tend to agree that they lost the 2016 election because they overfocused on divisive racial and gender grievance issues instead of focusing on a broader campaign of economic well-being for all. The Democratic message alienated a large population of white working class people, particularly in the Rust Belt, that had been negatively affected by a, economically by globalization. These people felt abandoned by the Democratic Party, which used to be the champion of the working class, regardless of race or gender. It also alienated certain groups of minorities, who saw themselves as American success stories that did not accept the negative stereotypes thrown at much of the white population as racists, sexists, and bigots. Donald Trump then managed to court these alienated groups by suggesting that he had their back even without laying out specific programs that would help these groups, and by suggesting, particularly to whites, that they'd never be accepted by the Democratic Party unless they scraped and groveled, answering for the actions of long-dead people that they had no role in and no benefit from. The role of true racists and white supremacists was actually negligible. There simply aren't enough real racists to make a dent in national-level politics in today's America. So, by having an increased focus on support for those economically disadvantaged and toning down the negative racial and gender issues, it is reasonable that one could easily dismantle the Trump strategy or remaining true to core democratic values by supporting working class people who have been negatively affected by globalism, even if those people happen to be white. Since this seemed like a reasonable course of action, why didn't the Democratic Party take it? The short answer is that the economic situation of most of the developed world is actually far worse than the average person understands and far worse than the average politician is willing to say. In 2008, the global economic system came very close to crashing entirely. The cause for the crash was not a single party issue, but caused by the deferral of economic responsibility by successive administrations of Democrats and Republicans alike. Some key instances of various administrations passing the buck with short-term economic fixes rather than accepting rational economic policies that would hurt their re-election chances follows. FDR's seizure of American gold in 1933 
Americans were paid $20 per ounce for their gold, right before the government revalued the gold to $33 an ounce, effectively stealing 45% of the American people's purchasing power by inflation in order to cause inf uh, growth in the economy by allowing for greater government spending. LBJ's escalation of the war in Vietnam, along with the Great Society programs of increased welfare, caused massive deficits for the time. Known as guns and butter programs, these increased borrowing and caused foreign powers to cash in their dollars for gold at higher and higher rates until subsequently the succeeding Nixon administration was forced to break the dollar's final tie to gold, suspending foreign powers from converting their dollars to gold at a fixed price. More than two-thirds of America's national gold holdings had been lost before this policy was put into place. Ronald Reagan's dramatic increase in military spending arguably caused the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it also put the government on a path of increased spending and debt without a corresponding increase in taxes to pay for the programs. Despite riding the economic boom caused by the widespread adoption of internet technology and presiding over the closest thing to a balanced budget the U.S. federal government has ever had since, Bill Clinton signed the law that abolished the Glass-Steagall Act, which had separated commercial banks used by ordinary Americans and investment banks that were usually only used by richer and more sophisticated individual investors in order to make more risky investments. He also pushed for greater regulation on banks to force lending quotas to poor people and minority communities despite their actual ability to pay for mortgages, causing risky investments. Without these two factors, the economic crisis of 2008 would have been impossible. George W. Bush oversaw tax cuts along with massive military spending after the events of 9-11, wasting trillions of dollars in, in overseas conflicts that did little to actually prevent the potential for future acts of terrorism. With the collapse of the, of the tech bubble under his watch, he oversaw a Federal Reserve that lowered interest rates to near zero which increased the rate of risky borrowing and investing that took place within the economy. Finally, the housing bubble popped in late 2007, leading to the unpopular government-funded bailouts of mega banks and massive printing of unbacked dollars by the Federal Reserve, which bought up toxic housing loans that were forced onto the banks by the economic policies of Bill Clinton. With the election of Barack Obama, did not come to a return to economic sanity, but instead a massive new entitlement program in the form of Obamacare, and increased debt spending and money printing by the Federal Reserve. Ultimately, the national debt doubled under Bush from $5 trillion to $10 trillion, and doubled again under Obama to $20 trillion. Trump's tax cuts and policies thus far only seem poised to increase the national debt even further. Rather than a rosy economic situation, with the promise of advanced robotics and automation bringing us into a future of abundance, each progressive administration has brought us deeper into what ultimately will result in an economic collapse of the economy of the United States and a worldwide reorganization of the financial system around new rules, rules which the U.S. alone will probably not be allowed to write due to their massive mismanagement of the economy for successive decades. If this new future of abundance was actually upon us, what we should be seeing is declining prices across the board for all sorts of commodities, houses, cars, food, gasoline, energy, education, health care. If our society was becoming more productive, all of the things we need should be decreasing rather than increasing in price. Obviously, given the trend of such prices, this is not the case. The post-scarcity economy is not here. This, in the end, is the reason why the democratic establishment chooses to focus on divisive racial, sex, and gender issues rather than focus on the core well-being of the American people. At the end of the day, stirring up voters with imagined tales of a racist America is far cheaper than actually helping Americans who need help. 
Democratic insiders understand the underlying weakness of the global dollar system and that a dramatic doubling down on handing out benefits during times of economic crisis and overspending would only represent the final stages of a currency collapse. Collapses which have followed similar patterns throughout history, like in Weimar Germany, or modern-day examples like Zimbabwe and Venezuela. What about the rich, you ask? Haven't they been getting richer while everyone else has been getting poorer? Don't they have the funds and resources to restore the rest of us to support the people that rightly deserve it? Sadly, no. Even if taxes were raised to confiscationally high levels on the rich, there are simply too few rich people to fund the massive improvements in lifestyle for the poor, working, and middle classes who are struggling. Even if the rich were taxed at 100% and somehow did not object to continue working under such an arrangement, the resources which could be stripped from those few are simply not enough to meaningfully impact the many in a manner which socialists expect. Beyond this, much of the wealth of the rich is illusionary. Digital bits and bytes and bank accounts, government bonds that may or may not actually represent the value printed on their faces. Were those illusionary funds to come to the consumer market through redistribution, the result would be a dramatic shortage of supply in commodities, then a dramatic increase in prices, because printing money does not create wealth. And much of the elite's so-called wealth creation over the last decade has come as a result of artificial creation of money, not the actual creation of wealth. Yes, the rich have an abundance of mansions and fancy cars, but even once those are seized and sold off and split up, the resulting windfall of cash to the average person, split up so many ways to the masses, would not have a life-changing effect upon them. These are the economic realities that high-ranking Democratic Party insiders understand well. Handing out unbacked cash and benefits directly to the masses is one of the key signs of a death of a currency and an economic order. Such an economic collapse would not see the survival of either political party or even the United States, at least as we understand it today. So instead, we will continue to see the status quo box, a Democratic Party who will attempt to move voters through anger through racial issues, rather than through expensive benefit programs. A party who gets people to consume less and spend less because of their fear of global warming, rather than asking for an environment where they have the opportunity to improve their own condition through hard work. The Republicans have their own lies to tell to their base, a country that will become great again, where jobs will come back. But no, these things too will not happen until Americans suffer for their past excesses and make up for decades of spending on lifestyles far beyond their ability to pay for them. This is a status quo box, and short of some kind of miraculous hidden technology ready to dramatically improve the productivity of the world, it is the one we are stuck in. Today's energy alternatives and supposed futuristic inventors have yet to deliver on their promise of wide-scale abundance available to all. I would suggest to you this is because the elite fear the rollout of such technology, a source of power and industry that could decentralize the world into self-sustaining, abundant families and communities that would have little need for an elite to rule over them with force. But that is a topic for another day.